Kitco Mining special coverage of Resourcing Tomorrow is brought to you by Discovery Group. Hello and welcome back to Kitco Mining with me, Paul Harris. We're here at Mines and Money in London, in England, and today we're talking about mining sector trends. And I have great pleasure to be joined by Comrade Van Schipansky, uh, Group part, or Partner and Director at Boston Consulting Group. Good afternoon, Comrade. Good afternoon, Paul. Great to be here. Um, thank you. Let's uh, start off with, uh, why don't you give us a, a brief overview of BCG's mining practice, what you do and who you do it for? So our mining practice is a global practice. It's embedded as part of our industrial goods practice, which in turn makes up more than 20% of BCG's global revenue. Our mining practice is largely geared towards uh, the largest companies in the sector. We're serving five of the five largest global diversified miners on the, on the planet um, and, and a good handful of, say, the next 20 or so. Um, and uh, we serve them globally, right? That is in, in London, but also, of course, a lot of operational work would, no surprisingly, happen in Australia, in South Africa, in Chile, in, in North America, in the Middle East. Okay, thank you. So you're very well positioned to, you know, with your fingers on the pulse of what's happening in the mining sector from the big guys and the middle guys. Um, what, what have been some of the sort of key highlights and, and lowlights for you that you've observed this year? So this year, I think what we what we're observing is, um, in a way, a, a return to the to the cyclicality of the the mining industry. It's always been been cyclical, and for those of us who have been in the industry for for a number of times, who have lived through the Chinese super cycle and the and the both uh, upswing and the the downswing after that, I think what we're seeing clearly now is a differentiation uh, between commodities. Right, we're seeing clearly uh, continued strong demand and, and supply demand deficit in, in critical minerals for, for the energy transition. Um, copper, nickel, um, aluminium, uh, high-grade iron ore. Uh, and, and we're seeing conversely clearly uh, uh, a freezing out almost, if you say, or a lack of a lower investment clearly in, in, in coal and, and other fossil, uh, fossil minerals. So it is, uh, it is a transition, if you want now, from, from mining companies to reposition their portfolios. Um, it is, of course, uh, as always in the industry, a drive for operational efficiency. And it is a uh, combined search to, or effort to bring digital tools, digital methods to productivity improvement, but also increasingly to improving ESG performance. Thank you. And you mentioned, sir, I want to sort of dive into some of the things you mentioned there. You mentioned that there's uh, structural supply deficits uh, approaching very fast in some key commodities, key critical metals for the energy transition. Um, is this setting the grounds for a new super cycle? You know, the last one was 20 years ago with China. Um, is this setting the groundwork for a new super cycle? So the, the, what a super cycle really is, is, a, is demand accelerating faster than supply can catch up, right? And the mining industry and the world generally reacts to economic incentives. So uh, yes, we expect the some years of, of, of sustained uh, attractive prices for, for key commodities, but uh, I've been in industry long enough to see that ultimately supply does catch up. Um, and, uh, and, and so I would expect that I mean, it's always difficult to make forecasts for five or ten years from now, but this, nothing of these of these uh, cycles will ever, will ever stop, right? So we will, yes, we will uh, see incentives to to of course um, in, in invest, but uh, also investments take a long time, right? The average time to develop a copper mine is, I think, about between fifteen and eighteen years or something like that. So hence, you you always get these periods where supply just 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 can't catch up. It ultimately does particularly if we go, and that's, the, I think, the topic of the mining conference here, into a circular economy, right? If we project out another 15, 20 years, then we will have a lot more material to recycle, including from automotive batteries that just they don't exist today. So the initial response now must be to increase production, to build the stock, but eventually we're going at some point in time to a situation where recycling will step up massively, which will increase the supply, which will then bring prices down to a certain degree. That's interesting. Now, there's various other things. You know, before we came on air, we were chatting about various other things that you're, you're looking into. Obviously, with the Resourcing Tomorrow conference, ESG has been a big theme in the mining sector this year and uh, last year. Um, so decarbonisation. 
in the mining sector and, and humanity in general. How, how are things progressing there? And how realistic are the targets that uh, have been set? So the, the, the short answer is not fast enough. I think that all of us who have followed what happened in COP27 and, and the uh, other headlines that say we can essentially forget about being able to stay below 1.5 degree would have to conclude, not, not fast enough. Um, I think almost all mining companies now have <clears throat> 2050 targets. I mean, Fortescue, I think, probably leads the pack with a 2030 target of, of being not only net zero, but effectively a real zero, as we heard today. So targets are, are out there. When you then ask um, companies, OK, so what are your interim steps? How will you get there? What will it cost? What are exactly your initiatives? Then you will very quickly discover that a lot of CEOs are only beginning to realize that there is a lot more to do than what they have done so far. Yeah, it does seem that um, to reach some of their targets, companies have sort of penciled in technology that doesn't exist. They're assuming that technology will come onto the stage that will help them solve part of the problem. And, 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 that's, and that's, I would say, normal. And that's not only confined to the mining industry. Right? I mean, you could ask the aviation industry and say, how are you going to get to net zero? And they will all tell you, yeah, it's going to be part of, it's going to be sustainable aviation fuels and 30, another 30% 30 is whatever hydrogen. And there will always remain some gap to, to target that people just don't have the technology for. So that's not unique to the mining industry. That, that I think is, I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, say that. But of course, there's, there's going to be a huge step up to, uh, that will have to happen, not only in deploying existing technologies, and, and I think we're learning a little bit from, from when we're looking at, at public, public announcements, say, of, of Fortescue. We want to spend six billion to get to uh, net zero by, by 2030. And you scale that up and, and uh, calculate the numbers for a BHP or an Anglo or a Rio Tinto. You get to multiples of that. And I think that's, that's where I think we don't yet have the full transparency of what that journey will cost and what technologies it would have to entail. Okay. Well, what do you think is the, the real driver of this? Is it the companies really wanting to be good corporate citizens under their ESG mandates, or is it really coming from government? Is it really coming from the financial sector, or is it coming from somewhere else? It comes from, from all of that. But I say the, the two main drivers are um, end users and OEMs on the one hand, and on the other side, investors. Um, governments, of course, play, play a major role, but let's, let's quickly zone in on, on consumers and, and investors. So uh, major users of minerals and metals, let's take, for instance, the auto OEMs, have decarbonized their own manufacturing operations, which means the majority of the CO2 footprint, the final product, now rests in the raw materials. That pushes the pressure to decarbonize up the value chain. Uh, that also demands that companies are able to not only give precise data about their company carbon footprints, but also about their product carbon footprint, which is much more challenging. Quickly to investors, um, we at BCG have done studies over a few years and, and already seen for some years, and that evidence is getting stronger, that companies that perform better on decarbonization actually earn a valuation premium. And that uh, is swinging through capital, uh, so, sorry, energy in, in, intensive industries like cement, chemicals, metals, and, 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 and now mining. And so investors absolutely do want to allocate their capital to those mining companies that perform better on ESG, which creates the incentive for companies to, in turn, lower their cost of capital. Okay, um, a lot of what you're talking about there is the, the scope three emissions, the emissions actually in the supply chain, whether you're going upstream or downstream. And uh, for, for the mining companies, perhaps other companies in general, that's a, a much more difficult nut to crack than working on the scope one emissions, working on the scope two emissions. What are some of the sort of key challenges there and how do you see those being overcome in the mining sector? So just to, to put numbers to that, right, for a typical mining company, um, about 90% of their emissions would be scope three. Right? So that's a, uh, and, and it could either be downstream for a producer of met coal and iron ore, it could be upstream for a gold producer. But uh, in, in terms of absolute CO2 tons, it's largely downstream because the bulk's just are way uh, more than the, the, the gold produced, of course. So there, it is essentially about decarbonizing the steel making process. Um, and that is obviously not in the hands of the, of, of the mining industry, unless they are ArcelorMittal and are <laughs> vertically integrated. But for the big ones like Fortescue and Rio Tinto and, and BHP, it's about working with their, with their uh, customers, essentially, 
um, and and it all has to, will have to come through partnerships and and innovation. So what will have to be done, and other industries are are demonstrating that, for instance, the shipping industry, is that you need value chain partnerships, right? You need alliances that bring together the mining company, the technology provider, the steel company, the downstream uh, automotive company, packaging company taking the product off to really decarbonize the whole value chain. So uh, H2GS in, in Sweden is an example of, of that, of bringing hydrogen as a, as a reductant, replacing metco. Uh, requires new technologies, requires new uh, processing technologies, all of that. Okay, the, these ESG aspects are becoming a, a more important part of the reporting cycle for mining companies. Pretty much everybody has their sustainability reports now with their environmental footprint, their, their water consumption, and obviously their, their emissions data. But um, there's been a lot of calls from investors and other groups and the, the miners themselves that there's too many standards that we're expected to meet. There's too many uh, different bits of paper we're expected to file. Everybody measures, seems to measure things in a different way or interpret a, a specific metric in a different way. Um, it seems there's, 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 there's more data, less information, if that makes sense. Yeah, there, there is a lot of confusion and it's been a source of frustration in the mining industry and also, frankly, for investors. So in a, in a recent CEO, CEO, mining CEO discussion we had at PCG, that was the predominant topic. And, uh, and, and the mining industry basically uh, complaining that, that this is an extremely confusing uh, situation. Um, the solutions to that are, are not obvious, right? I mean... Uh, uh, the ICMM, I think, is making uh, 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 trying to make a debt into that, but even that is 27 or 28 companies, by far not not the whole industry. I think what you really need is a um, alliance, whatever I call it, roundtable, joint initiative that brings together investors and the mining industry and and NGOs. So, for instance, take the take the tailing stamp standards that they that they recently developed a number of three years ago after the Brumadinho and Samarco disasters. That was driven by uh, the Church of England, another investor, uh, the ICMM, uh, and and uh, and I think it was one NGO. I think uh, on the on the table as well. You you need this multifaceted, multi functional approach to that really setting setting the stage. So, in my view, if if here. The ICMM came together with, say, a BlackRock and a KKR, um, and say the uh, Irma, or um, as, as an Initiative for Responsible Mining, uh, or something, another NGO. I think it would take uh, an effort like that to to bring some standardization and, and commonality to the metrics. Okay, thank you. Um, let's change track just a, a little bit. We've been talking about critical metals. You've mentioned it a couple of times about um, we're in a cyclical market, uh, mining's still cyclical. Um, but invest, sorry, mining companies have been returning capital to investors rather than perhaps reinvesting in, in, in new capacity. Um, and within that, the, the diversifiers have been adjusting their portfolios for this new reality of decarbonization. Some have been getting out of thermal coal and focusing more, getting more into battery metals. Others have seen um, thermal coal still as an opportunity. Um, so in terms of um, the grand scheme of things, is the capital available to provide the minerals that humanity is going to need to affect the energy transition and carbon decarbonization? So the I think the world today is not short of capital, right? I mean, the amount of uh, dry powder that exists in the private equity industry uh, is is just uh, an enormous. I don't have the numbers for that, but I can easily be, be, be found out. But um, capital markets are deeper and more global than ever. Uh, it is just still the, the the mining industry. I mean, has a history of of capital misallocation and, and investors who have strongly demanded to see cash flow back to them. Um, and, and secondly, we are going into ever more challenging jurisdictions and ever more challenging geologists. Right? So it's not that critical minerals lie under the surface in, in, in Australia. No, we need to go into West Africa, Central Africa, uh, Papua New Guinea, or, or many other very challenging geographies that don't have infrastructure, that don't have local um, talent, that don't have local supply of, of energy. Um, and, and so capital cost, project risk, project duration just goes up uh, significantly, right? And, and against that challenge, it is, it is uh, simply, I think, a little bit 
too easy to sort of blame the miners and say you're, you're, you're sitting on your on uh, on, on your cash, uh, use it, use it. Um, this is not easy, right? I mean, we can take examples for take Rio Tinto Simadu project in, in, in Guinea. The world needs it. It's super high grade iron ore. We need it to decarbonize the steel industry. But uh, neither Rio Tinto nor any of the other partners engaged in the project there has ever done a project of that scale in Africa where you need to build a new port, a 600 kilometer railroad, and do that all in a way that, that ESG standards would, would demand today. I think one, um, this is perhaps completely by the by, but uh, I read something recently this past week or so that um, Elon Musk's taken over Twitter. He's lost more in his net personal worth than the mining sector's worth. Uh, I don't think that's quite true. I haven't run the numbers, but uh, that is a, is a great example of, of, on the one hand, there, there is a lot of capital that maybe in this case should have been put to, to better use. But it's also an interesting uh, topic because, of course, Elon Musk, through his ownership of, of Tesla, um, is is now also a major player, of course, in the mining industry, and and someone who has very actively sought to uh, enter into partnerships with mining companies, investing to to jointly increase the supply of critical materials, uh, and he also through Tesla, I wouldn't say control, but at least sort of is able to direct where minerals in the future flow, right? So. Uh, if you want to get engaged in, 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 in recycling or in, in supply of materials or in new business models, saying leasing materials for circular use, Elon Musk wouldn't be a bad person to start talking to. Okay, that uh, takes us nicely into my final question. Uh, what do you think we can expect to see in 2023? What are some of the trends you expect to evolve or continue or emerge? So a big, big trend that I think we at BCG seeing in the industry, but also, I mean, frankly saying cross industry is the, is the topic of, of resilience, right? We're, we're living today, I and mean, we've seen it this year, this will continue next year into a world that seems to exist only in crises everywhere, right? Uh, and that will bring it uh, supply chain reallocations, that will bring it capital dislocations, that will bring with it uh, migration of, of, of people and talent. Uh, new technologies don't stop. Uh, so. How do I, as a, as a mining company, because we're here in the mining industry, um, make myself resilient to these multiple challenges that I can't foresee, that I can't model out, is going to be a major question next year. That sounds uh, fascinating. It's been a fascinating conversation. Konrad Veshupansky, Boston Stoning Group partner and director, thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. Thank you, Paul. It's been a pleasure. And stay tuned for more from Kitco Mining. Kitco Mining special coverage of Resourcing Tomorrow is brought to you by Discovery Group.